Crafter. I'm really glad you decided to pop in. Today, we are going to cover dies and die cutting, showing you the what and how to's that I have learned over my years of crafting. Dies are a fantastic addition to any craft room. They are used in several applications for card making, and you can also utilize them for cutting intricate shapes from fabric, for sewing, and even quilting. They are quite the versatile little tools. So where do dies come from? I love the history of things. They bring sense to an item and sometimes give you a better grip on how that item is intended to be used. And dies are no different. Dies reared their marvelous head in the mid 1800s through the shoemaking industry. The hand cutting that tailors had to endure made shoes time consuming and therefore very expensive, which meant a lot of folks just couldn't afford them. The invention of dyes changed the industry completely. Shoes for all was now a possibility. Soon after the industry realized that creating additional dyes in standard sizes would increase their production even more. And so it began, shoe sizes. And hey, we still use that system today. It's pretty nifty, I think. In 1977, the first manual machine was invented by Bob and LaDorna Eckenberg. They began a dye company that rules the market on commercial and home machines. Ellison, located in California, still in business today. Have you ever heard of Sizzix? Well, it was born and rolled out as their first in-home machine in 1977. Crafters finally had a way of creating mass shapes and sizes. And still a favorite today, in 2005 came the Big Shot. Let's talk about the dies themselves. The dies that we see and use today are a bit different than the ones that they use to make shoes. The closest thing that I could find to give you the best idea were paddle dies. These are used with a hammer and a mat. They look like a cookie cutter encased in plastic. Using them is pretty straightforward. They have a sharp side, which has a warning label on it, and they have a smoother size to them. Now you wanna lay your material on your cutting surface, hold the paddle flat as you can, and then you're gonna whack it with the hammer a few times. And it will cut your material. Now you can still find these guys if you look say on eBay or Etsy, or even a lucky stroll through a thrift store. The machines we use today have changed tremendously. If you have ever seen an older version of a machine like the Sizzix one I have here, you'll immediately notice a huge difference. This machine has no rollers. It has these large metal plates, one at the top and one at the bottom, and a handle that you pull down to cut your material. After using one of these, you will definitely appreciate your roller machine on a whole new level. The dies used in this red Sizzix came like this. You can't see the cookie cutter shape in these since they use this rubbery foam to prevent injury using your die machine. Now to use this machine, it came with a platform base like you're used to seeing in your newer machine. It slides along this track. You would then Add your paper and place your die over the paper and slide it into the machine. Now you wanna make sure that you have your die lined up in between the metal plate. Then you're simply going to pull down the handle to cut your shape. One thing I need to caution you about, in these machines, the pressure causes the handle to spring upward. If you don't hold on to it, you could smack yourself in the face, and we don't want that. Then you would pull out your paper, and there you go, a shoe. These thin metal dies are smaller and more lightweight compared to the ProvoCraft ones. These make them easy to store and are definitely more convenient to use. 
Now, I store mine on magnetic sheets in plastic folders like this one. These dies are more affordable than the steel ones. They're less expensive to produce. And saving money in crafting means more money for crafting. And that, my friends, is a win-win. Some very key improvements on dies we use today. Looking at the cut size of a die, this raised section here shows us exactly where the die is going to cut. And since it's not in a clunky case, you can precisely place it on your material to cut whichever section you desire to use. Things like photos or shaker cutouts are a breeze with these little marvels. Now, spoiling us further, companies make metal dies as companions to stamp sets. This eliminates the need to fussy cut after stamping. You just stamp it, run it through your die cut machine, and you are done. Now, as fabulous as thin metal dies are, they can't do everything. The material you can cut with a thin metal die is limited to mostly single sheets of light and medium weight paper. These dies are simply not strong enough to cut heavy material like chipboard, fabric, and other craft products. There are also size limitations to the designs that can be produced with thin metal die technology. Most scrapbook and stamp companies sell thin metal dies using generic terms like die, thin metal, wafer, or thinlet. When you purchase your dies, some sets stay connected, like this one. Now you can leave them connected if you desire, or cut them apart. I tend to take mine apart as I use these magnetic sheets to store them. This is really left up to the crafter, and there are advantages and disadvantages of both. Now I left this set together to demonstrate how to get them apart. Most will twist off the bracket easily, and some manufacturers will thin out the connectors so they're easier to separate. So you just simply grip the die and twist, and voila. Now, if the other side of the connector doesn't come off like this one, I can't twist this one, but I have to bend it to get it off. You'll see it left behind these little connectors. To get them off, you simply grab them with a pair of pliers like this, and you'll bend them down and back up until they come off. For not so easy connected dies, I use this cutter that I got from Harbor Freight for just a few bucks, and it does the trick, but it does need to be replaced quite often. Dies have these small holes in them making it easier to remove pieces of paper that hold onto the die. You simply use a pokey tool and you push it into the hole and it actually pushes the paper from inside of here up so you can get a hold of it. It prevents the material from being deformed or even to rip. I don't recommend using tweezers to remove intricate cuts. I have ripped too many or distorted them so bad they were unusable. A tip that I can offer you to help with paper that holds on to the die is to first fold a dryer sheet and run it through your machine beforehand. So you'll take your die and you'll put it down on the dryer sheet where you would normally place the paper. Now you run it through the machine and some of the coating on the dryer sheet will stick to the inside of your die, creating a temporary non-stick surface, helping things release a lot easier. I use this method when I'm doing a lace or a very intricate design like this one. I have several die cutting machines, yet I tend to stay with my Spellbinders Platinum machine for the most part. This machine is so much easier on my hands and shoulders. It has wings that fold up, which means it takes up much less room than the Big Shot. It is a bit lighter as well. 
Now, I'll never part with my big shot because some dies I have just don't play nice with my Spellbinder machine. I also have a Gemini Junior machine that I got for Christmas from my son. I didn't think I needed something so big that needed to stay on my desk, but now that I have it, I made some minor changes to my setup and it fits very nicely. It is fairly simple to use, though I haven't had it for long. I'm going to have to give you a clear review on it later on. So let's talk about sandwiches. No, not those kinds of sandwiches. These kind of sandwiches. Now, dye companies have changed machines and dyes over the years. And now we're going to discuss the changes in how you cut your material. It seems daunting, but after a while, you do get to know what's going to work and what's not. So what is a dye machine sandwich and why is it so important? Every dye machine has a companion plate system. And how you arrange the system is considered a sandwich. Now, if this is your very first time unboxing your machine, these parts can seem like a lot. The most important part of your plate system is your platform base. This will be used in every sandwich that you make. Next will be your platform top. Again, this is another plate that you will go to again and again. The cutting plates and the shims are other parts that are changed out or configured differently depending on the application you're using. Since we're discussing dies and die cuts, that's what I'm going to stick to today. I do want to mention that you can use other dies and things other than the manufacturers. There are a few tips and tricks that I will share with you that'll make cutting with your dies a whole lot easier. You can see here that my platform base and the platform top both have the basic sandwich instructions printed right on them. This will help you to remember what goes where without having to return to the manual each time. Spellbinders adds a lettering system in the order the sandwich is formed. So starting from our base, we can see that we need our platform top, our cutting plate, our paper, our die with the smooth end up, and our second cutting plate. Now I wanna mention these cutting plates do need to be replaced more often than we would like. They begin to get these deep grooves in them from dies and they warp from the intense pressure of the machine. Now scrapbook.com came out with what are called magic mats. These guys here are self healing and were created specifically for die cutting machines. They can be cleaned up and even reshapened in hot water if they begin to warp. So to cut out our thin metal die, we need our platform base, our platform top, our magic mat, our paper, our die with the cut side down, and our second cutting plate. Now we have assembled our sandwich and we're ready to take it to our machine. To cut our dies, we need to place our sandwich onto our die cutting machine. Our machine has rollers, so we need to line up our sandwich with the rollers of the machine, keeping the sandwich centered so that it runs through easily. And now we begin to turn the handle. You're going to feel some resistance as you begin to see the sandwich pass through the rollers. Now I do wanna mention, it should not feel like you have to force the handle to turn. If that's the case, something needs to be adjusted. Now you can see that using the sandwich configuration from Spellbinders, we got this absolutely perfect shape cut 
from our thin wafer die. Keeping in mind how the machine is designed, these rollers need to pass over and under our sandwich to spread the pressure out evenly across the die and our paper. This pressure forces the blades of the die to press into the paper, and that is how our cuts are made. But this doesn't always happen with some of the more intricate dies, like this snowflake die, using the traditional method found on our base plate and platform. Following that configuration with a die like this, your cuts are going to have what is called ghosting. This is a term used to describe missed cuts like these. You see how the center did not cut all the way through? Even into the center line, it looks very, very faded, and I can't even push it through with my pokey tool. Now, as you get closer, you can see that sometimes not even an impression is made, or in this case, barely an impression is made. So why does this happen? Either your die has an uneven raise in its manufacturing, or the rollers are not able to apply the correct pressure evenly over the entire die as it passes through. If you examine this die we're using, you will see the cut blades are very close together. This does not allow much give in the paper, so it takes more pressure and more work to get these blades to shear it. So how do we fix this? When this happens to me, the very first thing that I try is to reconfigure my sandwich like this. I'll place my top cutting plate down, my die with the blades up, then my paper, and then my cutting mat. The reason I do this is because if you think about it, the pressure that goes against your bottom plates loses its power as it comes up through all of these different layers. So by placing it face up on the cardstock, the pressure from the top roller is going to be greater since it has much less resistance. Now, if you have your die set horizontally against your plate, your rollers aren't always able to apply the pressure evenly along your die. So what you want to do is you want to set it vertically, especially on a die like this. You want the pressure of your plates hitting the smallest section it can so that the pressure can be concentrated against the die and these little tiny intricate cuts. Basically, diagonally is best to achieve the cut that you want. The smaller the width of the die going against the rollers, the better the pressure is. We're going to place our die face up. I have my cardstock, and I'm going to put that on top of the die. So there's my angle. My paper fits. I'll put my magic mat on top, and now it is ready to go back through my machine. Let's see if our new configuration gets us the cut that we're after. Now you'll notice my resistance starts here. And the reason for that is the rollers have just begun to go over the die. So it is a little more challenging to turn, but it should never be so hard that it doesn't turn. If it is, back it out and try something new. Now, let's see if it worked. Since I reconfigured everything in my die cut machine, look how easily those little tiny pieces just came out. Look at that. Absolutely a perfect cut. So that's how you solve getting these very, very close cuts to work in your die cutting machine. Now that we've covered how to switch around your sandwich a little bit so you can better cut an intricate die like this one, I have one more tip for you. 
What I do when I find that a die does not work with the original configuration of my machine is I'll take, in this case, on the back of my magnetic platform, I will place a note telling me that the cut blade needs to be up in the die machine for it to cut properly. If you have tried all of these tips and it's still not working, your die may very well have an uneven blade from the manufacturer. Sometimes you can fix that or achieve these results if you use what are called shims. Now you don't have to use the ones that come from the manufacturer. You can use cardstock, you can use foam, you can use whatever you would like to use to achieve what you need to achieve. Now, after using the shims and after trying all of this until your machine just won't turn, it's pretty safe to say that your die is not going to be able to be cut without damaging your machine or your plate system, or not that it would matter, even the die itself. When you're using shims, just be sure to remove them from your sandwich before going on to another die. Here's what will happen if you don't. If you run a thin-lit die through a plate system that is too thick for it and force it through your machine, your die and all of your plates that can will bend like this. And then your die will not cut evenly no matter what you do. Some people get lucky and they can undo the damage that was done by running the die back through the same method but upside down and they can fix it but to me it's really not worth it i would buy a new die and move on so remember to check that your shims have been removed you heard me say and you'll find in all of the instructions of your machines therefore light to medium weight paper so trying to cut a piece of 130 or even 110 in your machine may not work. This would be the result that you would get even with shims, even with diagonal, no matter what trick you come up with, it is just not made to cut this material. If your cardstock was heavier, but not smooth, it kind of had a little bit of a texture to it, you might be able to cut it. If you find a cardstock like that and you want to use this thicker paper, I would make a note of it and where you got it from so you know where to go and get it when you run out. That's not something that I do. I keep it to light and medium weight papers. I don't want to damage my stuff. So what I'll do to achieve a heavier weight is I'll take this medium weight one, run it through twice, and then I'll glue the two together and that'll give me thicker die cut. What would you use a thicker die cut for? I'll tell you what I use it for. This die here is, is one that I go to to make Christmas cards all the time. And it using a light to medium weight paper, it does kind of curl and fold and do some weird stuff when you apply it to a topper. So I'll cut two of them and I'll glue them together. And then I'll have this nice thick one and then I'll do some dot, some ink blending or something behind it, glue it to my card base, and it actually goes like this. Glue it to my card base, and I'll do like a circle or a fussy cut around it, and the card will open, and it'll be absolutely beautiful. But I do not enjoy forcing things through my machine that can damage it or the die itself. Something I use my dies for quite often is cutting from designer series paper. Now, I'll find myself loving a design that's either right in the center or off center. So I am so grateful that these little guys can be placed on your paper at any angle that you want them to be. So I'm going to take this guy. I don't want that white. I'm going to take this guy and I'm going to angle him like this. Now, one of the things that you're going to want to do whenever you're trying to get an exact cut from a specific part of the paper is you're going to want to adhere your die to your paper. Using painter's tape or masking tape or anything like that, I have found is not the best way to do it because when the pressure happens, 
it pushes the adhesive into the paper and the dye. And when you're removing it, you take the chance of ripping it. So the manufacturers have come up with what they call low tack tape. It's a, exactly what it says. It has very little sticky on it. You can also achieve this with washi tape. I've seen people use that. I like this green tape. It just really seems to work well. So I'm gonna want my first cut to come from this guy, but I'm gonna take this one step further. I'm actually going to make a cut just around the die of where I want to get that design. So now I have the rest of the sheet that I can use for something else. Say these little antennas, for instance, I just want the antennas and maybe the head to cut out of this one. So I'm gonna find a really pretty part and give this guy a tack down. And now I have two from one sheet and totally separate configurations. So I'm gonna run this guy through my machine in one pass and be able to get the entire ladybug cut out. So we're gonna place this one here. And then I have the little outline for it. When you have a lot of dies that you're putting on your mat, you wanna make sure that they're evenly spaced apart and they're all on the diagonal. You need the smallest amount to be able to spread the pressure out evenly. So that's what we're doing here. I'm actually gonna turn this guy around because the little antennas here are the smaller section. I'm gonna turn this guy around for the same reason, get them all spread out. This guy, I'm gonna send probably this way. So let's see how cutting out all these dies at one time work with this machine. Saves you a ton of time, allows you to get a card or paper project done, a lot faster doing it this way. So run it through. Getting the tape off of the die, it's important to do it in a certain way. If I were to grab the tape and pull it towards my cut, I take the chance of getting that weakened piece of paper that has the cut in it and ripping the top of it off. So I'm gonna stick my little spatula tool under it, grab the paper, and I'm gonna roll it back. See how it ripped? It ripped because of the pressure that the die machine puts on these dies to get them cut. And these little spatula tools work great to get the tape off without damaging your die cut. And I'm gonna do the same thing here. I'm gonna grab it right here and release the die underneath. And then just pull my tape free there. That one came off much easier. So now you'll see it doesn't wanna release because how tiny this cut is right here. It doesn't wanna let it go. So I'm just gonna use my pokey tool and I'm gonna poke it out. So I don't damage it or distort it by trying to pull it with tweezers. I can't even tell you how many projects I destroyed using tweezers. Okay, so I got my little antennas with the stripes on them. And very carefully snip off the antennas. I will have a link in the description for this die because she's really cute to play with. And I would glue them to the solid like so. Then add my wings and my outline. Isn't she cute as a button? That's one of the things that I use my dies with designer paper and how I do it. I had mentioned dryer sheets, and this is an example of a die that I would use a dryer sheet on. 
all these little tiny cuts, paper tends to really stick in there. So how you do it is you'll fold a dryer sheet in half, place it on an angle on your machine, same as before, right on your mat. We're gonna place our cutting plate on top, or our top plate, I should say. And now I'm going to run it through my die cutting machine. So now some of that non-stick coating or some of that anti-static coating is inside of the die, inside the little tracks of the die. So when I peel it off, look how easy it comes off. When I peel it off, some of that coating is trapped inside of here. So when I use a paper with it, like say this one, it's not gonna stick. It is really neat. When I discovered this, man, I told everybody, even people that didn't craft, I told them because it was just that exciting to me. Now watch this. I'm gonna hold the paper down and just lift the die and look at how easy that came off. Nothing is in the die itself. No pieces of trap paper. It all came out and it just makes what's called weeding a piece like this, an absolute dream. They just fall out for the same reason. On the sides of the cutting blades, there is that anti-static cling from the dryer sheet that just works amazingly. Now I used to use, there's other methods of doing this. There is um, wax paper. But what I found with the wax paper is it left some of the wax behind inside of my tracks. So when I would go to weed it and pull the paper out, some of the paper, especially if I used a matte and not a high gloss designer series paper, it would have this glossiness to it that you just couldn't make go away. So I didn't enjoy seeing that. So I stopped using it. I was so disappointed tried parchment paper, leaving a piece of parchment paper in the die, tried it that way, but it just wasn't as satisfying. Look at that. Look how quickly I weeded that in just this tiny little conversation we're having. It is absolutely amazing. And I will repeat the process of the dryer sheet each time I use this specific die, but with some of the other ones, like the snowflake one, I have only done that die once and it's managed to release paper like a dream each time. I have really enjoyed spending time with you today. I love providing tips, tricks, and strategies that make paper crafting fun, simple, and easy to follow. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing if I gave you any type of value to your card making. And I'll see you in the next one. Happy crafting!